Hello, Ralph Hotchkiss. Thank you so much for coming on Tracing Global on Wheels um, and participating in our podcast series. Thank you, Ming. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good, good morning. And um, so just to do a little introduction on Ralph for listeners that are with us today. Following a motorcycle accident, accident in his junior year at Oberlin University in 1966, Ralph became a paraplegic. He is a 1969 graduate of Oberlin College. Ralph is the co-founder of the Revolutionary Whirlwind International, a group dedicated to improving the lives of disabled people in the developing world. The organization's mission is to make it possible for every person in the developing world who needs a wheelchair to obtain one that will lead to maximum personal independence and integration into society. Since the 1980s, Ralph has worked as a a wheelchair designer, designing new and innovative wheelchairs. He was a 1989 MacArthur Foundation Fellow and has received countless other awards and honors. So so with that, Ralph, we're going to start off with our first question. So can you tell us about Whirlwind Wheelchair and share with us some major accomplishments that you've been able to achieve with it? The main thing we've done is go to developing countries, um, find people with disabilities who are who are already building their own wheelchairs or at least um, modifying the the throwaways from the north, the, the wheelchairs that come in as donations, which tend to be pretty bad wheelchairs, but people are people are rebuilding them locally and making them actually work, actually work on the unpaved roads and, and stand up mm-hmm. so that they're, they're at least just barely good enough. And we work with them to, to, um, to improve the designs, to make them as, as good as, as good as can be yet still inexpensive. Really, what we're doing is stealing their good ideas and mixing them with others from other places, then coming back to them with uh, with with mixed chairs, basically from from all of these countries. And in most cases, people then could go right ahead and um, and build lots of chairs for their their local market, sell them for. Typically two hundred dollars more or less, mm-hmm. and and um, and people would have a chair. And this is maybe the thing that I'm most proud of. We have a chair that you can go around the world with. You don't have to have a credit card to call California for repair parts. You don't have to have a lot of money um, in your account to to pay for the shipping. You just go to the local bicycle shop or blacksmith, and they can make virtually any part of this chair locally while you wait. So if you're if you're crossing Uganda, Tanzania, and your chair falls off the roof of the bus, yes, it happens all the time. Um, you can you can go in virtually any medium sized town and find one or more blacksmiths bicycle shops where they do real repairs. They don't just change parts like most American bike shops, but they will, they'll cut and weld your frame, bicycle or wheelchair, and and they'll get tubing off broken restaurant chairs, for example, or wherever they, they can find tubing, mm-hmm. bend it, weld it, and send you back on the road. That's great. So my next question for you is, in an ideal world, what does your dream wheelchair look like? What capabilities, features would it have? Well, well, that's changed over the years. In the 60s, early 70s, I I was making chairs that, that would climb stairs and allow you to stand up and squat down. I believe mm-hmm. that squatting down was, in fact, more important than standing up because uh, if you're 
because things things to fix tend to be done underneath. For example, the the plumbing under a sink, um, and and if you stand up and drop something, well, you got to get to the floor to get it. So uh, those were all those were all good ideas for wheelchairs, but in fact, most people in the world still don't have a good wheelchair. Most people don't have a, who need one don't have a wheelchair at all. But just as important, once they get one, it's it's not a great wheelchair. And in fact, in fact people in the eighty percent of the world that doesn't have the money need not just a wheelchair. They need the best of wheelchairs because they have the worst of conditions, the most rough roads and and un, unpaved pathways they have to follow to get actually to their house. Um, more than half of the houses in the world are not accessible by what I would call an accessible road. And so we need the best of chairs designed not only to push yourself over these rough situations as best you can, but designed so that it's easy for somebody else to, to help you. So that when they push you from behind, the chair isn't always stubbing its toe with the little front wheels getting caught in the, in the rocks and dumping you out frontward. It has to be a chair that will roll easily when they push hard from behind as well. I think it's your rough riders, right? That when you sit in them, it's hard to, it's hard to fall when you hit a rock. That's right. That's right. Um, I used to fall out of my chair once or twice a year, like uh, cruising down M Street in Washington D.C. Once I remember, it's it's a nice downhill slope, and I was going really fast and. All of a sudden, I, I hit a chuck hole I, I couldn't see, and and it th threw me forward, and I did a, a somersault in my chair, a loop-the-loop, -loop, and uh, that okay. sort of thing would happen once or twice a year, often at night in the rain when I couldn't see the cracks in the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it happens to me all the time when I'm not paying attention. Um, I, oftentimes, and the, faster, the faster you go, the more fun you're having, the, the, the more dangerous it becomes. <laughs> but I, I, I started building chairs with a 50% longer wheelbase. Now, going on 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, and these chairs are no longer than a regular chair. It's just that the front wheels are right at the front corners instead of being behind the footrests. And so, so a 50% longer wheelbase is just enough that the chair pretty much cannot tip forward. Mm -hmm. And in all the years I've been riding this newer type chair, I haven't fallen once. And it's not because I'm more careful. I ride wilder than ever because I have no more fear. <laughs> um, so are these wheelchairs being sold in the U.S. as well? I know your organization is emphasizing on wheelchairs to developing countries. Um a few are being sold in the U.S., though I recommend people go overseas and, and uh, visit one of the shops. The closest one to the U.S. is in um, Mexico, just an hour's drive north of Mexico City. And you can go there and, and uh, check into an inexpensive hotel, wheelchair accessible, more or less, more or less. And... Uh, and Leave a week later with a great chair that's that's custom fit to your body and your needs, and you can pay for all of your expenses with the saving compared to buying an American chair in the U.S. That's great. The chair so, sells sell for under two hundred dollars in Mexico. That's great. Wow. Um, so our next question for you is: So you started four hundred one wheelchairs in the nineteen eighties and have had a lot of successes with it. So I have two very similar questions. I'm just going to ask them all at once. If you can start your company all over again, what would you do, do differently? What advice would you give to someone who is trying to start a company that is similar to your own at this day and age in the 21st century? I don't know what I would do differently other than um, be ready to mix high tech and low tech a little bit more than we did then high production level versus custom making mm -hmm. uh, all of our original shops 
for just a few people, um, between two and 20 people in a shop, um, cranking out chairs in methods that allowed them to build a chair in somewhere between two and five person days per chair. So one person, one chair, two to five days. The, the ones that did it in just two days still were small, still were efficient. Um, now, a chair could be made in, in way less than two person days if it's, if it's a, a high, highly efficient mass production large scale shop. And, and so the cost of that chair might be cheaper, but on the other hand, the chairs made by those larger shops tend to be less less repairable. If, if you happen to bust it in half in the middle of India, for example, you can get it fixed. Same chair, India, China, Africa, South America, Central America, you can get it fixed wherever you are. Yes, wow. The mass produced chairs tend more to require that you order a part from the factory. Mm. And that's not freedom for me, mm -hmm. and, and for and and for the poorer users in particular, they they need they need chairs that can be fixed. Mm -hmm. Um. So, and then what has been some of the biggest challenges over the years when establishing, maintaining, and then growing World War One Wheelchairs International? Chairs. I would say the biggest single problem we've had is that is that local industries have been at times destroyed by philanthropic um, giveaways of old-fashioned chairs in large numbers. So, for example, in Malawi 25 years ago, um, a European wheelchair manufacturer sold a lot of chairs to some nonprofits, some some donors who hauled, hauled those chairs all to Malawi, gave away 5,000 chairs at once. They had never given chairs away before. And after they gave, they gave those chairs away, mm -hmm. the donor just disappeared. Okay, so a lot of people have, have um, half-decent chairs, old-fashioned chairs to ride, but in a couple of years, those chairs start ne needing parts, needing footrests. The footrests get smashed. The brakes stop working. The hubs in the, in the large wheels break down. And there are no spare parts. So what do you do? Now, these are, these are factory-made European wheelchairs in which the footrests were cast aluminum. You can't cast aluminum and make a replacement in a, in a blacksmith shop. You have to really reinvent the wheel the wheel or the footrest and make something something out of local materials that works. And so people ended up spending too much money on repairs and eventually giving up on, on the chairs because they were so hard to keep repaired. And that was the biggest problem we've ever had is the shift in the market that came with the, with the manufacturing and distribution for free in many cases of lots of lots of old fashioned chairs from places like China brought in by by northern donors american european donors and when when that happened it was no longer a sustainable marketplace Yes, it was cheaper for the original chair to the to the wheelchair rider, but if you live in a developing country and you have a disability, you need a you need to ride a wheelchair. You need a chair that will last you a lifetime, or at least be repairable for a lifetime, like a good under hundred dollar bicycle is today in those countries. And if somebody brings you a chair that's not repairable, mm -hmm. that you can't get parts for, and that tends to break down and never worked very well in the first place, especially over rough ground, tends to tip over, tends to, tends to be, the, the wheels tend to be skinny and get caught in the rocks and the, and the rough ground. 
then it's just not it's just not going to get you all the way through school and enable you to to get a job and keep that job and and be there on time and and raise a family and go on and uh, go on and on and on knowing that you're going to make it to the end of each trip so that's the biggest problem we we have had and my feeling is that we need to compete with that well to make chairs that are just as inexpensive as the mass produced ones in China but made locally and repairable with local materials and get money from those donors to pay for those chairs some of the donors are very anxious to buy locally as they can they won't have to pay for shipping among other things mm mm-hmm. but make sure that those chairs are the best of chairs not the not the cheapest but the cheapest per year of use and chairs that can be used and repaired for mm-hmm. as near to a lifetime as possible hmm i never knew that was such a problem those donor chairs that eventually over the course of a couple of years um then are unable to be repaired it's a terrible problem i mean just think about so you get a wheelchair and you go back to school maybe you're 20 years old and you're in 5th grade because because you've been kept out of school by met like a mobility for so long now you go to school for a semester or two and your chair falls apart what do you do reminds me of a woman in ethiopia she was 17 she was in 3rd grade she had gone back to school she got only one semester in the school even less than that when her front wheels fell apart they were plastic front wheels Mhm. Oh and, gosh. And uh so we tried to make her new wheels out of wood. Um unfortunately the deforestation had happened so badly in Ethiopia we couldn't find a 4-inch diameter tree trunk to to make her um wheel out of. Eventually she cut a log out of the corner of her grandmother's house where the logs go together at the corner. sliced it off and we made front wheels out of that. And wow. but of course that front wheel didn't last as long as a really well made one from one of our factories would have. Mm-hmm. Sure. Wow. We have we have a great front wheel design from Zimbabwe. You've seen it. It's extra wide. Um 3 and 1/2 inches wide instead of just 1 inch wide like a typical wheelchair front wheel. And mm-hmm. it'll cruise over mud, sand, um gravel. very very well and also doesn't dig in when somebody else is pushing you from behind pushing up at the top of your seat back because that gives a strong force against the front wheels to push them into the ground if the front wheel isn't wide it won't float over the ground wow so what resources would help you speed up the product progress of uh, wheelchair design um wheelchair design is going pretty pretty well and pretty fast. I would say that what we really need is more support for the local shops because the more local shops are building chairs, especially those local shops that are run by the wheelchair riders themselves. And most of our early shops were like that. Then 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 our uh, our network of inventors is bigger and stronger and we can all of us can steal more good ideas from the others mix them together and and keep at, keep improving our chairs our chairs could be lighter they they could be um easier to build more efficient to build there're a bunch of things we'd like to try we'd like a footrest that gives more protection to your feet um we've got footrests now that are way safer than a regular western wheelchair i mean if you're riding a typical wheelchair in the US and you run into something what's your front bumper your front bumper is your toes and if you're barefoot you're in trouble um so we have we have footrests with 
toe protection, but we would like that to be even better. We'd like a foot vest that your foot will not fall off of, at least not easily, not often. Mm -hmm. And and we'd like we'd like better better leverage propulsion mechanisms. The hand rim on the rear wheel gives you great control, but it doesn't necessarily serve very well for covering five miles each way to school or work over unpaved roads. Um, there have been some good experiments in MIT and other places for lever driven or or remote hand rim, other kinds of ways of propelling the wheelchair. We like that to be even better. And well, there, there are plenty of people out there who, who would try new ideas who are part of our network now and would be if would would stay in our network if they had some way to keep selling chairs and be supported. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's amazing with the progress that you've made. I know I I have a tie light Aero Z mm -hmm. over here. And, that's, um, that's a great wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Most of them are are wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, they cost what was it? how much did yours cost? Um, it's around, around two, three thousand dollars. Okay, two or three. That's that's a lower cost tie light. Um, so, what kind of wheelchair do you use? I think you use a Rough Rider. Sure, of course. It's the only one I dare use because <laughs> it's the only one I can go around the world with without having a crate of parts following me as I go. I, I do carry a toolkit though, and it's just like yours. Um, so, so is the fixed flat tires and. Uh, and the fixed um, broken broken parts, whatever whatever broken parts, just enough tools to take the chair completely apart and put it all the way back together again. That's all I need. So even with a rough rider, what kind of uh, wheelchair malfun malfunctions are you prone to? Uh, not many. For example, I saw in your. Uh, Log that you have trouble with your front wheel bearings. Mm hmm. I do. Um, the Rough Rider has a vastly superior front wheel bearing um, that is maintainable. We don't know how long because we've only had them on the chair for 20 years and we've, we've seen so few failures that we don't really know what goes wrong with them. But we use a different type of bearing. Yours has sealed bearings in it and they're of a small size and they're. So the front wheel of our chair uses a, a totally different type of bearing design from a, from 120 years ago. And it's, it's using the bearing of the front wheel of a bicycle. The whole front hub of a bicycle costs less than a dollar practically anywhere in the world, except in, except in, the, except in the West. Um, they're a little more expensive here. Um, and that bearing has big balls in it. And when dirt gets in that bearing, the bearing is designed so that there's space for the bearing, for the balls to push the dirt away. And the kind of bearing you've got on your chair, once dirt gets in it past the so-called seals, um, the seals hold the dirt in there and the dirt grinds up the bearing. Also, your bearing is much smaller. It has less than half the load rating of a standard bicycle front front hub, um, oh. so we we have very little trouble with our front hubs. And if somebody has trouble, they can just go to any bicycle shop, which is anywhere in the world, pretty much, and the parts are there waiting for them. Oh, I see. Wow, wow. Well, maybe I should start riding a Rough Rider too. Mm -hmm. um, Though, though now that you now that you've been uh, accustomed to something as light as a titanium tie light wheelchair, um, a Rough Rider because it's mild steel, the same tubing that restaurant chairs are made out of. Um, it's um, the Rough Rider is going to be heavier than what you're used to, and so oh, wait a minute, we're 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 working on lighter Rough Riders now. And the technology for lighter tubing is working its way around the developing world. A few countries have it, have lighter, lighter, stronger tubing. Mm -hmm. And so 
Maybe <laughs> maybe we'll soon have a Rough Rider that will be as light as you, almost as light as your tie light. But how heavy are the Rough Riders? Because I know my wheelchair here is about um, thirty five pounds or so, probably forty. Because I I have a built in shelf that was added later on. Oh, that's where your shelf is, and your chair doesn't fold, correct? No. Okay. Well, the Rough Rider folds, and that was at the insistence of riders who need to fold it in order to ride on the local buses without paying double or triple for their bus ticket. Um, it folds flat, and thus it'll fit on the rougher easily on the rougher or behind under the back seat of a of a of a bus. And mm -hmm. wow, that's very convenient. And with 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 the features that we have, and of course the chair has parking brakes and folding foot rests and and so on. And also we have heavier tires. We use mountain bike tires, fatter fatter rear wheels, and that adds that adds a couple of pounds to the chair. Altogether, it weighs forty five pounds, so probably ten pounds more than yours. Mm, okay, that's not that much more though. I imagined it to be. Much more. Yeah. Why is staying fit especially important for individuals with disabilities, specifically wheelchair users? Um, to protect ourselves. Uh, I'm, I've been around for a while, long enough that I've seen some of my friends, um, including myself, have some trouble with, with um, blood pressure, with, with um, blood circulation. Mm -hmm. And staying fit, exercising all the time, exercising regularly every day, some and and several times a week, a lot, is the only. Well, it's not the only. Our diet is also really important. Um, diet and exercise are the best ways we have to protect ourselves from having those problems. My my folks, my parents are both ninety four. And they're doing just fine um, because they exercise every day. Wow! And, and they 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 give me a good example and give me some good reminders and tips as to how to how to exercise well. I like your videos, and I've been exercising, following your example. Um, oh. I also do isometrics without any any tools at all. For example, I'll run my hands in a, in big circles as if I was pushing all the way around on a hand rim that was up higher, mm -hmm. tightening all my muscles so hard that my arms kind of vibrate, shake a little bit from the tension as they go round and round. And that's a way to get an isometric, uh, a maximum force exercise without having to carry any equipment. Of course, your little rubber bands are easy to carry as well. And I'm going to go get some and, and start doing that as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I'm honored that you watched my videos and even doing some exercises. Um, so how can wheelchair users stay fit? You, you've already alluded to some of these, but what kind of exercises or recreational activities can they get involved in? So swimming is great, um, and if you can if you can swim a mile, that's a, that's a nice lot of exercise. Um, though I don't do that very often, I would say um, several pool links or a quarter of a mile is a nice nice long swim for me. Um, going up. Going going outdoors, just going as fast as you can, or can or as fast as you, as fast as is fun to do. Um, I purposely park further away. Parking is usually cheaper or easier to get if I don't go right to where right to the downtown spots that I'm most often driving to. That's of course only for gringos, um, <laughs> be, but. If you're driving a car, park further, or even get get off get off the bus in 
in the bus stop that's say the most convenient or the easiest easiest to use and push a few extra blocks and go fast be late <laughs> so you have to go fast and that's a good way to get exercise too mm -hmm. yeah i know um when you're late you're pushed too i've yep. often yep. i've often had to push really fast because I'm always running late these days mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so a lot of wheelchair users develop common um, areas where they have pain shoulder problems elbow ten tendonitis carpal tunnel have you mm -hmm. experienced these kinds of issues and if so how mm -hmm. have you dealt with it Yes, I once read that 80% of us have those troubles sometime. 25 years ago, I spent spent a better part of a year not even being able to lift myself to transfer um, because of elbow-shoulder problems. Um, when, I, when I feel the, the beginning of some of those problems, I'm, I favor that that arm or that shoulder as much as I can, hitchhike up hills, ask people for a push if I come to a hill that I know is gonna, going to set me back and recovering from a strain. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so I've been able to, I've been able to keep those, those issues at bay, but a better wheelchair design with, with, some other way of pushing the chair other than hand rims might also help a lot. And that's a good excuse for all of us to be thinking about what are the possibilities, options, and, and ways of making wheelchair propulsion more efficient without adding to the complexity, without making the chair so fancy that you can't repair it in the middle, in the middle of Uganda. And, um, yeah, it's it's a it's a tough it's a tough challenge, but we haven't made that much progress in the hundred years of wheelchair building. What you were saying about the the shoulder pain, just mm -hmm. changing up the positions that you push. Yes, or or for example, I push right on the tire instead of on the hand rim. Okay, how does that it, help? It, um, pushing on the tires like low gear, pushing on the hand rim is second gear, if you think of a bicycle or an automobile equivalent. And in regards to wheelchair design, how can it be designed um, in a way that uh, is less um, taxing on the shoulders? There's, there's a lever-driven chair done by people at MIT that um, allows you to push with lower force than you would need to push on a hand rim. Gives you a lower, a lower, lower low gear and also gives you a, a, a sort of a hand rim equivalent gear as well. So it's gives you the equivalent of a range of about two, two, two steps of gearing. And, and it, Powers on the push. Well, that's the same as a hand rim. It don't, the hand rims only power on the push, at least when you're going forward. Um, the MIT one is better for your shoulders in general. And it could be much better. What if instead of just pushing forward, it would power the chair both on the push and the pull? There have been a few people who have tried things like that over the years. But if you wor work your hand in a full circle, not, but not way down where the hand rim is, up where you can reach all parts of that full circle. Mm -hmm. Then it would be the equivalent of, if you think of a four-legged animal running, um, a horse or, or some other animal, they're designed well for that kind of, kind of um, propulsion. Well, so are we. Um, because that's who we used to be to some extent. And so if you, if you look at a, a primate who runs on all fours, now look at what its front legs are doing. Try and find some propulsion mechanism that does just what a chimpanzee might do while climbing a tree 
or well running along along flat ground that does what that chimpanzee is doing with its front legs that might be close to what we're best engineered for that we have evolved to to work more efficiently when propel, propelling ourselves with our front legs mm mm i see reverse engineer us to go back to the wheelchair look at what we can do best and make a wheelchair that will go nice and fast when we're doing what we do most easily whatever that is okay so next we're going to move on to travel so you've ever <laughs> Obviously, travel to a number of so, countries. And cities. What are some of your favorite countries and cities that are more wheelchair accessible that you can that you can recommend to the general population, the general wheelchair user population? That they Just as a general to? rule, the poorer the country it is, the better the access is. When I think about all of my friends in the United States. I can only visit about 5% of them in their houses. The rest of them have too many stairs to get to their house or too much of a slope to get to their front door. Whereas in Nicaragua, in um, Tanzania, the majority of my friends are visitable because their houses initially had a dirt floor. Maybe they still have a dirt grip floor, or maybe they've gone high, high tech and, and put in concrete or stones in their floor. But in the process, they didn't raise their house way up. They just built, they just built a, a flatter floor where it was. And you go in the front door, and the, and the house is only a little bit higher, just enough to keep the rainwater out. Only a little bit higher than the than the land outside. And again, that's more than half of my friends there and less than 5% of my friends here. That's 10 times more people can I go visit there than here. So I'd say just go for it. Wow, that's go, a very interesting concept. Go somewhere where you can find where, where you can find friends. Disabled People International, uh, organ, uh, an umbrella group of disability organizations worldwide, can hook you up with active organizations in virtually every country. If you can find friends through that organization or any other way through Missing in the I'm sorry, Mobility International USA um, in Oregon. They can hook you up with people with very similar mobility challenges to whatever you might have. And those people can help you organize a, a visit wherever they live and would love to help you do that in most cases. Mm -hmm. So just go for it and, uh, and see what happens. And again, like you, I've done most of my traveling on my own. It just works just, it just works fine. All kinds of ways of getting around the poor the country the more easy the more easily you can get help because people aren't busy you know starting their cars and zooming away they're all walking and they're all going right by far more pedestrian traffic they're hmm. going right by and they're ready to help you they'll hmm. ask hmm. that's so, very inter yeah. interesting because um I've mainly traveled in big cities, and uh, I've always thought that, you know, if they have limited the, infrastructure with the mass transportation system, then I can at least, you know, get bystanders to help me. Um, but what you're saying is, you know, the less traffic and, and the less um, sophisticated the infrastructure is, the more accessible it is in some ways ironically in some ways ironically yes um, go to Barrow Alaska <laughs> the furthest north the northernmost airport in the world um, go during either either all midnight midnight sun June July mm -hmm. or go go when it's uh, 24 hours of darkness and really cold 
Hmm, that does not sound very appealing. But it's it's way different, and it's and it's really interesting because people will help you stay warm and get through the snow because they're all having to do it themselves. They know exactly how. Of course, you wouldn't. You would need a little wider front wheels and rear wheels in order to succeed. Um, but you can buy them. Wow, maybe I will give that a try. So, what are the, what are、um, some of the your biggest challenges traveling as a wheelchair user? Buying the ticket—that's <laughs> the biggest problem I have.、Um, once once I have a ticket, airlines airlines are pretty good. I've been traveling since long before we had even aisle chairs in most of the developing world. But they would they would get me into the airplane and into a seat. It would either be two people or four people lifting my body, or maybe they would have me transferring into a wooden kitchen chair, and they'd lift that up over everybody's head and carry me into the airplane and plop me in the seat. It all worked. And of course, <laughs> the the onboard Aisle chair, which you talk about very well in your in your blog, is is a wonderful development. Every flight over three hours or three hours or more is supposed to have an onboard aisle chair, and most of them do now, especially in the West. And that allows you, if you're really good at transferring in these teeny bathrooms,、um, to use the To use the loo while you're flying somewhere, and if and some planes even have bigger bathrooms that are easy to transfer in, or they'll combine two two of those teeny bathrooms into one, and that makes it better yet. Back before there were any aisle chairs, I used to slide just slide down the seats. This or, I'm sorry, slide down the aisles on my on my seat.、I'd, Transfer the floor and and scoot down the aisle as best I, as I could. I'm sure you've done some of that as as well.、Mm-hmm. I would also use that to get into airplanes and out of airplanes、um, if they just weren't ready or willing to、um, to let me on board while we were at the at the front of the plane arguing about it. Um, if I got a chance when nobody was looking, I would just hit the floor and scoot down, scoot down the aisle, and be in the seat before they knew what to do.、Mm. <laughs> It also got me to the top of a seven forty seven once when the when seven forty sevens had a little spiral staircase to the second floor. So how can along the same lines, how can traveling be made more accessible? For, for wheelchair users and for individuals with disabilities in general, I'd say start with our with our right to right to travel.、Um, most important, just guarantee us the right to travel. That was true a hundred years ago in trains and 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 steamships. What What do you mean by the right to travel? In trains and steamships a hundred years ago, there was no real access, but they would somehow get you on board. And the same is true today in the trains in Kenya or Uganda.、Um, all up and down East Africa, there are trains, and and in lots of other parts of the world, all over India, there are trains. There's no real access, but they just don't assume that you're not going to ride because you have a disability. They figure out how to make it work, and that's the the responsibility of the train、um, the train people. And passersby tend to believe that that if they can help, they 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 should. And so, and so, if you start with that right, and then work backwards, access comes in little little bits along the way. And in fact, worldwide, I've seen. Bits of access in some of the poor, poorest countries, as well as slow as hell, but in the richest countries as well. And and、um, yep. So if you start with the right, and then then the rest will follow. 
and travel a lot. The more we travel, the more accessible it will be 20 years from now, by far. If we stay home, hey, they say, mañana, mañana, tomorrow, tomorrow, we'll make it accessible. Mm -hmm. But if you're right there, if you're in their face all the time, as you are, as I have been, um, that causes access. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, so I, I do hear that you're moving about right now. So since we're on a pause, do you want to just move or get whatever you need to get? Okay, I'm fine. Okay, sounds good. Oh, here, let me lock my brakes. Maybe they'll keep them in control. <laughs> okay. Um, so what are the advantages of traveling in a wheelchair? Uh, you can go down long hills without... Um, without having to do anything. You can just coast. <laughs> the advantages. Um, it's easier to think of the disadvantages than the advantages. Um, yeah. Oh, here, here's the biggest advantage of all. I get to meet local people with disabilities who just blow me away with the degree to which they have made do with what they've got and have done very, very well. Raising children, doing jobs, fighting their way into and through schools, doing their own repairs, um, working with everybody in their country to make things better for, for all of us and all of them. So we're gonna move on to the, our last section now, which is talking about disability rights. Dis yes. Disability advocacy. So what are some effective ways individuals with disabilities can advocate for themselves? First, just be there. Um, be in all parts of your society. Go there, even if you know it's not accessible. Make sure that you have access to housing, public transportation, Schooling and jobs, those four. If you have access to all of those four somehow, and even in this country, we, re we don't really have it yet. We're just still working. Um, then, then you'll do quite well. Now, here's an ex another example of why I like to travel in developing countries more than I like to travel in most of the West. In this country, we're, we finally, after decades of delay, have access to inner city buses, to Greyhound buses, Greyhound and Trailways and others. But we need to give them 48 hours notice because only a few of their buses have, have lifts on them so far. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I've, I've certainly had nightmare experiences with Greyhound. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I, most of the bu Greyhound riding I have done, um, I've just sat on the front seat. While they're arguing about how they're going to keep me off the bus, I just sit on the front seat and I, or on the front stairs and get somebody to lift my ankles as I lift myself up step, step, step. I get help, but it's usually not from the bus people. Once I was traveling with my four-month-old son, and, and in Sacramento, California, they said, no, no, we can't ride. You have to have your own attendant. I said, I do. He's, he's this little guy here right in my lap. <laughs> and, as, and well, the irate um, manager of the bus station went to get the, the, the police. I held my um, Oshkosh straps of my son in my teeth slid up the stairs, got help transferring up into the seat, and when they came back there, I was ready to go oh. in the bus. And, oh, wow. And so, luckily, I feel luckily, the policeman who came to throw me off the bus was a black policeman, and I said, sir, should I sit in the back seat? <laughs> And he turned around and he just roared at the station manager. And I rode on the bus, of course. And almost every time that's been the case on airplanes, on buses, never had trouble on boats. Even though boats are the worst of access, 
Um, yeah, it's it's odd how sometimes um, the most challenging part is getting either the person who's driving the bus or staff members that are with with the with the company to help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I rarely waste my time even asking them for help. I mm -hmm. get it from passersby. Mm -hmm. They're far more, far more dependable. Exactly. I've I've experienced the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um so what were some of your proudest memories of either advocating for yourself or for others? My proudest times have been with um disability advocates, others who are who are better than I am. Um, who just working with them and watching watching them change society more radically than I ever could. Judy Human um, and family lives in Washington D.C. Um, she she lived in New York in the sixties seventies. <clears throat> Would mm -hmm. come down to D.C. and just just attack the hill with dozens of, of disabled folks to get the most basic changes, like like the beginning of access to public transportation, buses in particular. Um, she would arrange all night vigils in front of the Lincoln Memorial, march followed by marches on the Capitol. And she would get scores of us, in some cases hundreds of us, to join in and uh, participate in the fight just as hard as we could. Um, Ed Roberts, others who just would not take no for an answer. They would not take no. So it's been it's been cheering for them that are my pr proudest, proudest moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had the honor of meeting Judy a couple years ago and she is amazing. You're right. Mm -hmm. And um, wow, to see, you know, from that generation, so many of you have gone on to do such amazing things is really empowering for us, the younger generations. What, what would you change about how people have advocated for you over the years, whether that be your parents or your, your spouse, your friends, your siblings, if you have any? Mm -hmm. I have lots of siblings. Um, I've been married twice, both times to disability, very strong disability advocates. And um, and it's just it's just great to watch them work, all of them, to make things happen. My parents, my parents um, were great. Um, helping me get back into an inaccessible university college um, and and working working both with and, and against um, the people at the university and other people who thought they had the right to exclude me just not not taking no for an answer ever ever what what did they do right what methods um manner what methods did they utilize or mannerisms did they exhibit that you feel should be repeated or if if you if it needs to be changed what what changes should be made mm -hmm. i don't know how to change it i think that 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 what the advocacy network has done has pretty much always been appropriate for the time and place that it in which it happened <clears throat> people were most important, endlessly persistent. Just keep coming back. So, it took, so what if if accessible city buses took decades? That didn't stop people from riding them every day, wheelchair and all. You talk about people lifting you up and over other the heads of passengers to get you into buses. Yes, that's what it has always taken some kind of some kind of significant help to get into these buses with lots of huge steps but but there have been people doing it for over 50 years that i that i know of 
I've been there following their example now for over 50 years. And by the stories that I know of go back much further than that, go back as far as the existence of buses goes. People have been fighting to get onto buses since the day buses were invented. And, and, and we just all help each other and never take no for an answer. Never. Mm -hmm. That's right. So what are some improvements that still need to be made? So you look at the minority groups such as LGBTQs and, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, and they've mm -hmm. all made major social progress. And I feel like disability, the disability movement has obviously made progress as well. But in some mm -hmm. ways, maybe this is just my perception, it seems a bit slower. We are seen more as second class citizens, more mm -hmm. so than say black people or LGBTQs. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you think that is and what changes still need to be made? Um, you have done exactly what I think is the most important, and that is to integrate. You joined the Black Student Union in Oregon. Mm -hmm. and I did. How did you know that? Okay, I read your, I read, read your website. Every, every word. <laughs> and, and some of us have integrated in many other ways. Go to the wrong country. Live, the, live in the wrong neighborhood, what people think is wrong. Um, intermittently, give a little priority check when choosing, when choosing families. The more integrated, the better. Um, just by chance, my family has people from several corners of the world in it. My extended family is all kinds of, all kinds of mixed. India, Africa, Europe, et cetera, et cetera. And that makes it better because we're brighter when we're, when we're mixed with people who aren't just like us. We're always brighter. And uh, what, what changes do you want to see for the future of the disability community? More jobs more integration in the workforce. That's perhaps, it's, it's happening now in schools. Very important, I'd like to see the integration work better in schools. Not so much of separate but equal, not so much of special ed in a back room in a back corner, but mix with the kids. That, that'll, that'll not only help the kids with disabilities a lot, that'll help everybody else. Because, because the other kids, the not yet disabled kids, will be far better ad advocates when they get into the workforce if they grew up with side by side with best friends who had disabilities. Whenever you integrate kids, they have best friends across the barriers. They always do because they love people. Kids love people, generally. And, and if they're not given the opportunity to have best friends from of every other kind there is, then they won't know what they're missing. But if they do want to know what they're missing, they won't do without it in the rest of their life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think integration is very important. Mm -hmm. So my last question for you is, are you comfortable with being labeled disabled? If not, what other words would you use? <laughs> I, I certainly don't want, would rather not be labeled handicapable or any of those fun, fun words. Having a disability is, is, is what I have. Hey, that's fine with me. Well, Ralph, thank you so much for, um, for such a rich conversation here. And uh, that is a wrap, and that's the end of our podcast. podcast. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, and just keep on kicking ass.